The Water for All Partnership is an EU-funded initiative for scientific research and innovation for the water sector. Its goal is to tackle water challenges to face climate change, help to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and boost Europe's competitiveness and growth to achieve a water smart society. The Pillar D of Water for All, led by Water Europe, intends to demonstrate the efficiency of innovative solutions through the Water Oriented Living Labs. This is a series of interviews to the frontrunners Water Oriented Living Labs that will join forces and collaborate in the next phases of the program. Enjoy the series. Okay, good afternoon. Today we're interviewing Alexandra from the city of Mechelen about the Water Oriented Living Lab Mechelen. Hello, Alexandra. Hi, hello. First question is, what are the innovative practices, technologies and methodologies used in the Mechelen wall? Well, um, as a city, we're actually constantly doing roadworks, um, improving our public space, making it more green and more blue. The new thing that um, we have is that we try to really make a connection with the citizen on different levels to do this. So first of all, um, this, this is done by sensibilization. So we try to explain what, it, what are nature-based solutions and why are they necessary in our city. But we also try to explain um, why it's important to have uh, nature-based solutions also on private property of the citizens. So we do this um, by, for example, um, doing some citizen science with our citizens, um, organizing information markets, things like this. So in our eyes, this sensibilization is really crucial because if you don't understand um, why it's important to have nature-based nature solutions, then why would you care? Why would you choose for um, for a tree in front of your house in, instead of a car parking space. So um, for us, sensibilization is crucial in, for, in order to be able to do participation. And then um, the another thing is that we try to offer a, a helping hand or to try to do some co-working with the citizens. So um, we give our citizens tips on how they can do adaptations very easily at home, small ad adaptations uh, on the size of the citizens um, situation. Um, but we also have an adaptation coach here at the city who uh, goes out and visits the citizens, um, looks really at their situation, things together with them, what are simple things that they can change, uh, what are the quick wins? What are things in the long term that they can do? So it's really a, a back and forth, a two way, uh, a two way uh, conversation with them. And a, a very nice example is also uh, that the citizens can take out some of the tiles on public domain in front of their house and put uh, plants in there. So it's on public space, but it's their small garden, if you could call it that. So uh, it's it's also a, a well some kind of co-working that we're uh, that we have with the citizens. It's really great to hear how citizens are central in your living lab. Absolutely. What are the societal, economic and environmental impacts and benefits on the local territory and community of the Living Lab? Yes, so um, on a societal level, it's actually, it's a bit what I already said. So um, we really try to, to generate a general understanding of the urgency for more nature-based solutions in and around the city um, and make it clear that we are, this is not only for us as a as a public institution but we're in this together it's it's the same world we're living in um and in order to make this work in order to do all these changes to make us climate proof we need we also need the support of our citizens and their engagement uh, to make this work so um creating and involving um, them is really key here um on an economic on economic level um, of course, the more nature-based solutions that we have in a city, the more we decrease the heat island effect. And we, by that, we increase the health and the resilience of the citizens. So um, we're doing this as a public institution, but again, with our citizens. And um, if we wouldn't be doing these adaptations, 
Mechila would become a place that is very susceptible for climate extremities, um, making the citizens just move away to better places. Um, and this, of course, would be disastrous for, for the economy of the city. And then the last question, uh, or the, the environmental level. Um, so Mechila historically has uh, water running through it. Um, but it is an uncontrolled tidal river at the time. It was an uncontrolled tidal river causing floods and diseases in the city. So the water got uh, covered up for a big part. But now, of course, we see the, 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 the value of these green, of these blue and green infrastructures in our city. Um, so we're opening up the waterways again with new technologies. And this, together with the smaller adaptations that our citizens are doing, we can really make a big impact um, if you only know that just um, letting your grass grow a little bit longer, um, the it can and that it can reduce the stress heat in a garden for up to three degrees Celsius. Like little things can have a big impact. So this is what we really try to to generate. Thank you. Uh, what lessons have you learned, and what challenges have you faced, and how did you overcome these challenges? Mm-hmm. Well, um, as as we're citizen focused, this is also the the challenge that we see, because we, when reaching out to our citizens, we often notice that we always reach the same citizens who already have the same mindset and already know know the issue, um, but people who aren't that much aware of of climate um, climate change or aren't or it's not on the top of their list it's very hard to reach them and to to uh, yeah they will not be as susceptible for our messages so we try to mitigate this we don't have the golden solution yet but we try to mitigate it um for example by going into schools and uh, explaining the importance of nature-based solutions to children this is of course a long-term investment uh, but it's necessary to generate a future-proof um, mindset, if you could call it that. Um, and then also to, to reach the people now, um, we are looking into ways that we can reach them. So to find the what's in it for me, really. Uh, for example, if climate change is not on the top of their list, maybe some economic aspects are, and this would be a new way, a new way to, to really reach them. So we try. But even then, it remains difficult. As I said, we don't have the golden solution yet. And in this is a very personal opinion of me, but um, and it also hurts to say, but I think it might take a crisis. It might take a crisis, uh, just like uh, it took the energy crisis for people to realize that solar panels are interesting and the rush to the solar, solar panels and other um, sustainable solutions. I hope it really, I really hope it doesn't, but it might take a crisis, yes. It's not easy to reach all the citizens, but anyway, I think you're doing a very good job. Uh, what is the future vision now? And can you provide some tips and tricks for all the living labs that are currently in the process of establishment? Yeah, um, I would say start somewhere. Uh, start somewhere and adapt from there because if you wait until you have the perfect plan laid out and you then start carrying it out, um, you will anyhow have to adapt again because of because of the, the, the ever changing climate problems, because of new technologies, new improved understanding and visions and, and knowledge. So it's better to start somewhere, be flexible, be adaptive and uh, work from there than to wait until the golden solution arrives at your doorstep. OK, thank you for sharing your experiences. And I'm very glad that the Living Lab of Mechelen is able to engage a lot of citizens, which is not easy for many other Living Labs. Thank you very much.